Um, so welcome everybody to our uh, new seminar of the uh, topical series on the Adronic Nuclear and Atomic Physics Group at the University of Barcelona. Uh, it is my pleasure today to welcome uh, Pierre Artuí. Pierre Artuí is a postdoctoral researcher at the um, Technical University of Darmstadt. Um, he graduated in 2018 uh, from CEA Saclay under the supervision of Thomas Duguay and Jean-Paul Lebrun. Uh, after that, he was a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Surrey for um, about two years under the supervision of working with Carlo Barbieri and in general with the Abinicio Many Body Group at Surrey. Uh, and since uh, mid 2020, he's been at Darmstadt working in Achim Schwenk's group. Uh, Pierre is, is, is kind of a, a unique, I would say, physicist in that he brings in a lot of very different expertise. He knows uh, uh, about many body, about different techniques in many body physics. Typically nowadays people specialize in just one and Pierre is one of the few people I think that can actually handle more than one. Uh, and in particular, he's an expert in automatic diagrammatic or diagram generation. And this is what we, he will talk about today uh, towards high precision initial calculations with automatized diagram generation. Uh, Pierre is happy to take questions uh, as we go along. So please feel free to you know, either post them on the chat or, or let him know that you have a question. Uh, take it away, Pierre. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Arno, for this uh, very thorough and kind uh, introduction. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to present to you my work. Thanks a lot for this uh, for this opportunity. And since Arno has been pretty extensive in the in the introduction, let's uh, let's dive right in. So as I understand, uh, the group in Barcelona is very diverse in the, uh, in the research interest you have. So I decided to start uh, very broad and coming back to, uh, to the atomic nucleus. Uh, so the atomic nucleus uh, is a system that is, uh, that is um, in which a whole diversity of phenomena arise. Uh, be it related to ground state properties like mass, radius, excited state properties, vibrational bands, for example, uh, the decay mode with respect to strong or electroweak interaction, uh, and reaction properties as well, scattering, fusion, fission. And additionally to all those di diverse pheno phenomena, one of the key aspects is that the nucleus uh, is related to a complex uh, many-body problem in the sense that it's a, a mesoscopic system. Uh, you range from a, a couple of nucleons to several hundred of them, so you cannot treat that uh, with few-body few methods. You cannot treat that uh, with uh, statistical methods either. Uh, so mesoscopic system in which uh, finite size effects uh, are important and in which uh, various excitation modes rise at similar energy, which is very different from uh, what our colleagues in quantum chemistry have to face, for example. Uh, additionally to that, uh, another issue for us is that uh, we have to deal with a complex interaction uh, that emerges from uh, quantum chromodynamics that has a perturbative character uh, and once again at variance with uh, quantum chemistry for example we have to deal with three body forces four body forces uh, ideally up to a body forces which is uh, which is quite a, a challenge uh, so of course with just such a complicated systems uh, a whole diversity of approaches uh, have uh, raised over over the years um, with uh, various approaches that has been very successful into yielding uh, predictions, predictions uh, that are helpful for uh, experimentalists like shell model and energy density functionals. Uh, the issue though is that there is no obvious way to systematically improve such methods. So uh, how can you try to get uh, as, clo as close as possible uh, to, to the real results? In, uh, in a safe way. Uh, the thing is, ab initio methods uh, deal with that pretty well, uh, but they've uh, for very long be, uh, been restricted to the very beginning of the nuclear chart uh, due to their uh, factorial uh, or exponential scaling. 
So over the past 15 years, though, uh, ab initio expansion methods, uh, scaling polynomially, have been uh, developed or reimported uh, to nuclear many body physics. Uh, as well as uh, Hamiltonian model through chiral effective field theory, uh, numerical methods to pre-process the Hamiltonian, the development of uh, novel or hybrid approaches, and that has uh, helped uh, the field go uh, go much further in terms of uh, of mass and get out of the of the very few body uh, few body sector of the nuclear chart. Uh, so if I go a, a bit more into the details, uh, in the 80s already, you had uh, the so-called exact, uh, exact ab initio methods, Green's function Monte Carlo, no Korshen model, Fadei Jakubowski, hyperspherical harmonic. But uh, as I was saying, due to their exponential or factorial scaling, they were restricted uh, to the very beginning of the nuclear chart. Uh, then in the 2000s, uh, methods were implemented, uh, developed, reintroduced uh, in nuclear physics. So that's a couple cluster, uh, Dyson self-consistent screen function in medium similarity renormalization group, uh, and many body perturbation theory. And those uh, methods, which are expansion methods, so you, uh, you solve uh, uh, you have you get an expansion to solve your uh, Schrodinger equation, and you truncate at a certain order. Uh, well, once you truncate, uh, this yields a polynomial scaling, uh, so you're able to go uh, to go further up in terms of mass. Uh, but because they're uh, the symmetry uh, symmetry conserving or single reference method, they're restricted to closed shell nuclei. Uh, so only at uh, the intersection of those. Uh, magic number lines uh, that appear on the on the nuclear chart so only a few um, a few nuclei and sometimes neighboring ones when you use a self consistent screen function for example uh, so then at the beginning of the 2000s uh, new methods were developed uh, that's multi-reference uh, immediate SRG or symmetry breaking methods, uh, Bogolubov couple cluster, Gorkov self-consistence ring function, uh, Bogolubov many body perturbation theory. And with uh, such methods, now you're able to tackle uh, open shell, uh, open shell nuclei. Uh, mo mostly singly, uh, singly open shell at the time. Uh, uh, because uh, the symmetry breaking method focused first on breaking uh, the particle number uh, symmetry. Uh, but you're, you're already starting feeling uh, isotopic chains. And even more recently, uh, with the development of hybrid methods that uh, derive effective interaction from couple cluster or in medium SRG and use them uh, in valence space uh, shell model type approaches, yielding an uh, hybrid scaling. Uh, now we're able to fill uh, the gaps uh, in the bottom of the nuclear chart. Uh, so you see that routine calculation now go up to uh, and even a bit further than the nickel uh, isotopic line, isotopic chain. And you have some calculations that have been done uh, on and around the teen uh, isotopic chain as well. Uh, so that's where uh, ab initio methods are uh, right now. Pierre, uh, can I ask you something? Sure. Uh, what can, can, what do you mean by the hybrid scaling in there? Because if you just build some shell model interaction with whatever method you, you wish, I believe the scaling in solving the shell model problem is the same as before, right? It's just that. There's an ab initio method to obtain the Hamiltonian, but the scaling, what do you mean by hybrid in there? I mean, in the sense that, that it's uh, this two-step method and that you have first uh, first first course from the, uh, the ab initio method with which you derive your effective Hamiltonian, and then you have to, uh, uh, you have to solve it, uh, you have to diagonalize uh, it in your uh, shell model code. So I mean hybrid in the sense that uh, that it's a two-step method. Okay, but the scaling then in the diagonalization is like it's not polynomial anymore, right? I mean, as before. No, no, no. That's uh, that the typical uh, shell model scaling. Okay, sure. Then then we agree. Thanks. So I've been talking a lot about the the reach of ab initio method, but I've not uh, defined them properly yet. 
so what is the ab initio medibody scheme? Uh, well, of course, everything comes back to uh, your uh, A-body Schrodinger equation that we want to see, that you want to solve. Uh, you have your A-body Hamiltonian, your A-body wave function, and that's about it. The thing, though, with ab initio is that you want to start with a with a certain set of constraints. Uh, so first, you consider your nucleons as point-like degrees of freedom. Uh, we don't want to talk about uh, about internal degrees of freedom, about quarks here. Uh, we leave uh, all of that out. And then you consider your nucleons as uh, all your nucleons as active uh, in a full uh, A-body Hilbert space. Uh, so in that sense, you depart from uh, what you do in in uh, in shell model, for example, with a core in the valence space, uh, here all of your nucleons are uh, fully active. Uh, and then you consider elementary interactions, so two, three, uh, maybe let's be crazy, four body forces. Uh, so here, what I mean by elementary interactions uh, is interactions in which we don't try to incorporate more collective uh, collective degrees of freedom, so we have no dependence on the, the DIN. On the density in the way it's done in energy density functionals, for example. Of course, you solve your Abelish Schrodinger equation, and in the end, you should be able to estimate your error. Uh, and even better, you should have a, a systematical uh, way to improve uh, your calculation to reduce uh, the error towards, uh, towards the exact result. Uh, so that yields uh, such type of uh, a flowchart in in which you have some modeling that goes into uh, into constructing your Hamiltonian. Then you solve your Schrodinger equation. You obtain a set of observables: ground state, excited state, synergy, angular momentum, electromagnetic transition, whatever. Uh, you're of course able to compare them with experimental data because that's what you want to do in the end. And from uh, from the divergences that you observe with your experimental data, that gives you some feedback into your uh, the modeling of your Hamiltonian. Uh, of course, such a scheme doesn't come without uh, without questions uh, to ask yourself. A bit. What is the exact form of the Hamiltonian? What is its uh, link to QCD? So at the moment we use uh, chiral effective field theory. Is that uh, is that the right way to do to do so? And I was mentioning earlier that uh, ideally you want to you you need to, we need to go to a body forces. That seems of course unreasonable. But where can you where can you where should you stop uh, in the middle of the process? Uh, and that's of course for the Hamiltonian, uh, but it's the same for your uh, for your many-body method for the solving of the Schrodinger equation. Uh, what is its accuracy? Is it really doable to treat uh, fully active uh, nucleons up to a equals three hundred, or do we need uh, we will we uh, hit a wall at some point and then realize that we need more effective approaches uh, for such? Um, such heavy nuclei or for more uh, deformed nuclei uh, or whatever. So th those are the, the open questions the field is uh, confronted with. Uh, so that's for uh, the set of uh, what are ab initio method. Then, then I just wanted to show you a brief, uh, a brief subset of uh, results by uh, people in the community. Uh, so of course, one of the first thing people have done uh, is look at uh, even even binding energy. So here you have uh, the binding energies, the ground state energy rather uh, of the uh, oxygen isotopic uh, chain. And what I want to show you in particular is here you have um, you have the experimental uh, experimental value, and all those other plot markers here are uh, different. Uh, different ab initio uh, many body methods. And what you can see is uh, the result between those different methods that expand and truncate uh, the solution of the Schrodinger equation uh, in different fashions uh, are very consistent uh, with one another. And, uh, and those cal calculations at the time were uh, quite nice because they were, uh, with the integration of the three body forces, they were able to properly reproduce uh, the oxygen uh, neutron reply. Uh, but then, uh, depending, some methods have, uh, have some perks. For example, uh, self consistence green function, uh, when, you, when you compute. Uh, 
when you use it to compute uh, properties of a given uh, nucleus, when you can access some properties of neighboring nuclei, uh, nuclei as well. Uh, uh, so, so that's uh, pretty pretty nice. Like, okay, from oxygen, you could you can access uh, fluorine, uh, fluorine and nitrogen, and here. Uh, at different uh, different orders in the in the truncation, you have a nice uh, a nice agreement between the different truncation order uh, of the method. Uh, even some more uh, things that are more complicated to reproduce, like excitation uh, spectra, uh, are uh, can be tackled with ab initio or ab initio in, in inspired uh, methods. So here, uh, for example, with the valence uh, space immediate SRG. Where you have uh, the excitation spectrum uh, of uh, fluoride 19. And you can see that with the inclusion of the full three body forces, it yields a pretty good reproduction of, uh, of the experimental result. Uh, in particular, it do as well, if not better, as, uh, as the shell model in that particular case. Uh, so this really shows that uh, nowadays ab initio methods are able to, uh, to yield uh, experimentally relevant uh, re results. And uh, another uh, type of observable that we can compute, we'll come back to that later, um, are uh, charge distribution, charge, uh, distribution uh, point proton, point neutron radii, charge radii, this, all those kind of thing. Uh, so here in that case with uh, post dictions of uh, charge distribution for sulfur 36 and prediction uh, for, for silicium, uh, silicium 34. Uh, so that's uh, a very quick uh, overview of uh, what, what people can do in the field. Uh, and then I wanted to show you what we can do at uh, the frontier uh, of the ab initio mass domain right now. Uh, so, okay, what are, or rather, uh, and I'll come back to that later, what were uh, the limits uh, at the present day, or rather one and a half year ago? Uh, well, for TIN, uh, TIN 100, TIN 132, there were first uh, proof of principle calculation with couple cluster uh, a few years ago now in 2014. And more recently, people using a valence space in medium SRG had made uh, really, uh, really accurate, really precise uh, calculation on the uh, lower half uh, part uh, or lower side of the TIN isotopic chain from TIN 100 to TIN 110. Uh, so th that was uh, the limit, uh, the limit one and a half year ago. So if you want to go beyond this limit, uh, which method should you use? Uh, well, you want to limit the computational cost as much as possible. So let's maybe use a single reference method. Uh, then the thing is, for such higher masses, you have fewer and fewer closed chain nuclei. So if you can have a uh, doubly closed chain nuclei, so if you can have a symmetry breaking method, that's, uh, that's better. You really need at least one that uh, is able to tackle singly open chain nuclei, ideally doubly closed chain. Doubly, sorry, doubly open chain. And of course, you want to be able to access various observables. Uh, so in our case, our method of choice uh, were self-consistent green function. And then which interaction do, do you want to use? Well, you need interaction that converge relatively quickly and that are already proved uh, to yield a good reproduction of medium mass nuclei, because you can guess that if, if it's not that good for medium mass, that it will be even worse for, uh, for heavy masses. Uh, so we decided to, to go with N2LSAT and the recently proposed NN plus three and local non-local interaction. Uh, the constraint we had were that, okay, uh, we want to go past the TIN isotopic chain, but not too far because we did results that are converged enough. And because we have uh, a spherical code, we need uh, nuclei that are spherical or near spherical. So what we decided to look at uh, were TIN 100, TIN 132. Those are really the doubly close chain milestones uh, in that area. And then uh, xenon uh, 132, 136, 138, uh, which are open chain nuclei of experimental interest. 
So we started looking at a bunch of observables. Uh, first, we wanted to look at, of course, the ground state energy. The thing is, there we realized our calculations were not converged. Uh, so we turned with uh, to charge radii and distributions, and here our calculations were not completely converged either. Uh, but because of the way uh, the way the radius converges with respect to uh, uh, to model space truncation and with respect to um, to the harmonic oscillator parameter, uh, we were able to estimate uh, the converged result with relatively large uh, large error bars, but still to give uh, a window in which we are confident uh, that the actual result lies. Uh, and what that gave us is here, for example, in the case of the chart density distribution of uh, xenon 132, here this large green band uh, are all self-consistent green function prediction. So, okay, it's relatively large, uh, but uh, we can already uh, compare it with uh, the two-point Fermi distribution here in dotted line and with the, the gray euro bars uh, that have been extracted from the, the SCRIT experiment. And what we could see is, okay, first, uh, our radius is very close to the experimental one, so that's, uh, that's quite reassuring. Uh, this, uh, this plot was made with using the N2LOSAT interaction, by the way. Uh, so, so we have Pierre, the, sorry, the, the green band there is due to the convergence uh, uncertainty in the calculation? Yes. So basically what we did is uh, take a bunch of, uh, of calculations at n max uh, 11 and 13 with different value of E3 max and different value of uh, H bar omega. H bar omega, okay. And uh, and then that's the the maximum deviation uh, that we get. Uh, it's even um, uh, I, I can show you at the at the end of the talk actually, but it's uh, it's actually pretty nice when you look at the convergence of the radius, uh, because then you see that you have a bunch uh, a bunch of line that uh, that more or less cross in one place. And as uh, with the increasing n max, the line gets uh, gets flatter and flatter. And because this line cross, you're able to get uh, to gauge uh, like the area in which they cross, in which you're pretty uh, pretty sure that the radius is in the end. And do you okay? Maybe we can come back later. But the, more or less, what's the uncertainty that you would get in the charge radius? Which order? Uh, if you don't remember, it's fine. It's uh, <laughs> it's relatively large. I can uh, I can show you the the exact values uh, later on. I okay, have okay. Uh, not the charge radius, but the neutron skins uh, in the in the very same slide. And as you see, it's relatively large, but uh, but still good enough for some, uh, not all, but some experimental comparisons. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so in our case here with uh, this pretty, the band is pretty large, but okay, we reproduce the radius not too, not too badly. And one thing that it was of interest to, to us in that uh, it shows that we expect some kind of uh, weakly, let's say, uh, behavior inside, uh, inside the nucleus. Uh, that the experiment at the moment is not able to predict uh, because it lacks uh, it lacks luminosity. So the only thing they could uh, extract, which is already quite an achievement, I'm not trying to downplay uh, the work by our experimentalist colleague here, uh, but unfortunately they cannot go past a two-point Fermi distribution. Uh, so there's no way for them to uh, to gauge the internal uh, behavior of the charge density distribution. Uh, and then, as I was alluding to earlier, uh, we were able to, to do the first tab initial estimation of neutron skins for uh, tin uh, and xenon with uh, the n 2 set and the NN plus 3N local and local interaction. And you see that the two interaction yields, uh, yields neutron skins that have that have okay, relatively larger or bars, uh, but that are compatible with one another. Uh, the thing is, none of, uh, neither of uh, of them are perfect, though. Uh, the n 2 uh, uh tend to get smaller uh, neutron skins uh, because it has an issue with reproducing the 
nuclear matter symmetry energy, but at the same time, n 2 uh, yields us a pretty good uh, charge radius, as we can uh, we can gauge here. On the other side, uh, the NN plus three N yields more reasonable. Uh, more reasonable neutron skins, but uh, under predicts uh, the radius. Uh, so nothing is perfect here, uh, but that's uh, that's already quite something that we could uh, that we could achieve. Uh, and then we went even further in the comparison uh, with. Uh, I have a, qu a question. Yeah. Yes, I have a question uh, before you change slide. Uh, um, do you guys? try to see if there are like uh, energy density functional calculations for this kind of because there are nuclei that are relatively easy to compute uh do you know if you if there are like some published uh, density to compare because you cannot access the experiment directly uh if, if they have the same wiggling or like the same shape uh I looked. Uh, I looked at at the time, uh, and I'm pretty sure at least for tin one thirty two uh, they are, and it's uh, and it's relatively the same. Maybe not in the in the actual amplitude. Maybe it's more pronounced for us uh, than for the uh, the EDF prediction. Uh, but actually, such wiggly behavior is not at all a surprising uh, a surprising feature in the sense that it would be. Uh, only for this nucleus, and actually, I don't have the the plot here. Uh, but all uh, all the densities for all those uh, those five nuclei uh, present a similar uh, wiggly behavior in the inside. Uh, and even if you looked at other papers. Uh, from the EDF community that have uh, predicted densities, uh, it's actually quite uh, common to have uh, such an oscillation within uh, within the nucleus. Uh, so it's not really a, a surprising feature. Uh, what might be a bit more surprising is that maybe, but uh, the uncertainty is, here is pretty large here. Uh, maybe the the largest densities uh, just before. Uh, uh, just at the outside, uh, almost at the outside of the nucleus, that it could be that uh, xenon-132 is kind of a bubble nuclei, nucleus, uh, but the, the oscillatory behavior in itself is not surprising at all. Uh, so yeah, we looked even th further into comparing with uh, experiment uh, because uh, we reproduced uh, the luminosity times uh, differential cross section uh, of the electron scattering experiment on xenon 132 that was done at uh, as cre at Crete a few years ago. Uh, so if we focus at first on the lower half uh, of the plot here, uh, what you see you see a bunch of plot markers uh, which are the experimental uh, the experimental value extracted from Crete at three different value of the uh, of the electron beam energy. Then the gray bands here uh, correspond to the reconstructed uh, two-point Fermi distribution from the experiment uh, that we compared our charge density distribution with a bit earlier. And the three colored bands here uh, are our predictions uh, with uh, the NNLOSAT interaction. Uh, once again, the width uh, of the color bands comes from uh, our model space convergence uh, uncertainty that we discussed just before. So you see that even with uh, what is a relatively large uh, uncertainty uh, on our values, uh, well, we're able to pretty much uh, nail the experimental results uh, everywhere, except here where it's uh, where it is slightly uh, overshoot uh, along the point eight to uh, wind point one uh, inverse Fermi effective um, transferred momentum. So it's uh, it's really a, really a great reproduction of the experiment. Uh, on the other side, now if you look a bit more up, what you have here are the same, the very same plot experimental plot markers, uh, just just shifted upwards for clarity, uh, and in the dashed line. Uh, are the predictions with the NN plus three and local non local, and you see that here it completely overshoots uh, overshoots uh, the experimental results, and this uh, failure at reproducing the experimental results is not surprising because, as I was saying, uh, the local non local really uh, really fails at reproducing the radius, the charge radius in the first place. 
Uh, so all of this underlines the importance of having accurate Hamiltonians. Uh, we showed that we can we were able to reproduce uh, the discrete experiment even with uh, with what are in the end uh, unconverged results. So even unconverged result can be uh, of interest and show uh, the current experimental uh, limitations in the sense that the experiment we were able to only to go to the first two. Uh, uh, two dips uh, in the cross section, and this only extract a, a two-point Fermi distribution. Pierre, one question: uh, If we were to to or you were to show the error bands also in the local with the local non-local interaction, uh, you actually you actually order? see you actually see the error bands here. Ah, I see. The the radius is uh, so or. Or rather, uh, you you don't see the error bands because I plotted with a uh, with a, a dashed line. But if I were to plot the error bands, you would see exactly the same uh, same width of the line. Uh, the radius is so underestimated, even with relatively large error bars, uh, that in the end the error bands uh, don't matter. Uh, it's it just completely fades, and it was yeah quite surprising at first. We thought. Uh, we thought we did a mistake uh, in the analysis that uh, something was wrong, but we double check, triple check. And it's just that, uh, yeah, the radius is so underestimated that in the end uh, uh, it fails and the error bands are, are pretty small here. Thank you. Uh, so that's for uh, Xenon 132. Uh, and uh, even more recently, colleagues colleagues from the Triumph group uh, have put out a, a paper on the archive uh, doing uh, immediate message calculation on, uh, on TIN-132. And in their case, using a pretty, uh, a pretty clever way to, uh, to incorporate the, uh, the three-body thought through a, a novel normal ordering approach, uh, they were able to yield the first converged calculation on, on TIN-132. Uh, so as I was saying before, and as it's really showing here, uh, the goalpost, the frontier in terms of ab initio mass domain is really evolving pretty quickly quick and people are already uh, really tackling that uh, that thing. Uh, so that's uh, the limit, the, the point we're at in the community now. So on the limitations and how to circumvent them. Uh, well, we have limitations coming from the nuclear interaction. The old, uh, for example, the old and anti uh, carol potentials uh, were known to largely overbind mid-mass nuclei. Progress has been made. As I've shown, uh, you are now able to, uh, to have pretty, pretty good results even for, for teen isotopes. But the thing is, they are the typical trade-off in terms of reproducing the energy, reproducing the radii, reproducing nuclear matter properties, and it's not easy to, uh, to fix this issue. And the thing is, at the moment, the interactions are what drive the total uncertainty of our calculations. Uh, at the same time, you have limitations coming uh, from the model space size, uh, uh, from the model space. Well, as I showed you uh, before, in some cases, uh, we, uh, for large nuclei, we are not able to fully converge it uh, because uh, the three-body force is just too costly to fully store or to fully incorporate it. Uh, because even the many-body tensors that are the, the operator that we have to compute for our calculations, uh, they are too too heavy to be fully stored in uh, if we want to go to high order uh, calculations, so higher in our truncations. And the other thing is the model space size is what determines uh, in the end the, our computational time. So if you want to, want to go to larger model spaces, that takes more time as well. And the last thing is uh, the limitation in terms of the many body method truncation. So as, a, as I, uh, I was saying before, we have expansion methods uh, that we truncate at a certain order. And if we want to be more precise, we, want to, we need to go uh, to larger orders. Uh, and that means increasing the number of contributions. Uh, having an increasing number of contribution that you have to derive. It takes uh, time to link all of this by hand. Uh, there, if you incorporate three and body forces, you have 
an even more uh, an even higher number of them and that grows even even more even faster uh, so that's a lot of time uh, that you have to invest a lot of computational uh, cost as well so we want to to fix uh, to fix all of those issues so it's already on the way people are working uh, in their interaction community on a new fitting methods they're incorporating the delta isobar and that has shown quite uh, quite nice results already uh, they are now doing thorough studies of uncertainties related to the uh, uh, to the LECs that go into uh, into the interaction uh, using bayesian uh, methods for example uh, and especially uh, all of this has been an is being discussed uh, right now at an uh, at a workshop at an INT workshop that is still ongoing. So you can see that the community is really active uh, to tackle to tackle this pro those problems. Uh, in terms of model space size, people are coming with more clever normal ordering, that as I was alluding to uh, in the Chin 132 case, uh, things that like importance truncation method, tensor factorization, decomposition, uh, that are basically at the price of a very small error, uh, reduce uh, the full storage cost uh, by sometimes several orders of magnitude. So that's really the way to go uh, in the future if we want to tackle higher order calculations, if we want to tackle large or model space as well. And as for the increasing number of contributions, that's the focus uh, of the rest of my talk. Uh, so let's uh, dive a bit into uh, the many body uh, development process. You start with a certain formalism that uh, that already exists with that you come up with. So it takes a certain time to develop. And then you work on your uh, truncation scheme. As I was uh, alluding to, you truncate at a certain order. You have to derive a certain number of contributions. Uh, those give you a bunch of terms uh, that you want to code into a first numerical implementation. Uh, at first, it's very screwed. You do it, for example, in M scheme. Then if you want to move to J-scheme for uh, a spherical code, you need to do some symmetry reduction operation. Uh, and in the end, you optimize your code for it to be able to properly run in, uh, in actual production runs. Uh, so that, that divides the whole process into a set, uh, a set of steps. So you have this first formal stage in which you work with Vic theorem, with diagrammatic representation. And it takes uh, it takes months to years. It takes if you come up with the fo new formalism, very often it takes years, then some months to derive your uh, your uh, contributions at a certain order. And let's say five years down the road, you want to move to the, a higher order in the truncation. Then it's month again to derive those new contributions that arise uh, at a higher order. Uh, then you move uh, to a first prototype typing step uh, with your programming language of choice, working on your desktop laptop computer. And that's, let's say, six months uh, to first working code. Uh, then you need to do some algebra recoupling. So you take your uh, equation that you had in the first place. You have to, to throw in some uh, klebsch cordon stuff. And that's, once again, let's say six months in this reduction step. And then moving to production, that's let's say once again, six months for uh, adapting your code uh, to the cl your cluster of choice, making sure that it runs properly, benchmarking it, etc. So it's a very long uh, process. It's a very long, it's a very error-prone process. It's costly in manpower. And what I want in the rest of the talk is to illustrate this, focusing on the formal stage on the first step uh, of your process. Uh, so let's take a, a, a very well-known method uh, in the Abinishu community that is in medium similarity renormalization group. Uh, it relies on a continuous transformation that acts on your operators, the, the, the most well-known meaning, of course, uh, your Hamiltonian, and that you can rework uh, in a set of uh, ordinary of uh, differential equations. Uh, that are known as flow equation here. Uh, that is just the commutator of your Hamiltonian and this eta operator that is known as the generator of your flow. Uh, and without going into too much detail, the idea is to uh, decouple your reference state uh, psi uh, from uh, the excitations from the, the particle hole to particle two hole, uh, three particle three hole, 
excitation space. So as you increase S, uh, as you go along the flow, uh, you decouple here, uh, here completely psi uh, from the excited, uh, from the excited state. And this method has been very successfully applied uh, to numerous uh, nuclei, successfully extended, extended uh, to multi-reference approach, to valence state approaches, and even coupled with, uh, with uh, gener generator coordinate method, as uh, Benjamin illustrated uh, in his talk two weeks ago. So the thing is, okay, now let's say we want to go uh, to go further. We want to uh, change a bit this formalism and we want to go uh, the Bogolubov way. Uh, why? Because we want to integrate a static correlation that is deformation or pairing uh, from the start. Basically we want uh, a method that is able to tackle uh, open shell nuclei in a simple way. And, by in, and when I say in a simple way, I mean keeping the simplicity of single reference method, no cable density matrices, no valence space diagonalization. And we want to do this because we know it's successful. It has been done with uh, MBPT, with couple cluster, with a Green's function uh, in the past years and successfully applied uh, in nuclear physics or in quantum chemistry. Uh, so what do we need uh, to do that uh, as compared with the standard IMS algae? Well, we need to start from the quasi-particle Bogolubov algebra. We work on formalism uh, using the grand canonical potential omega that is just uh, your Hamiltonian minus uh, your particle number operator uh, that helps in constraining your number of, uh, of particle in the end. Uh, since you break, uh, you break uh, in our case, the particle number symmetry, you want to obtain all of your expressions in a safe way. And in the end, you have to code everything into your numerical code, the symmetry re restriction, et cetera, et cetera, a uh, symmetry reduction rather, et cetera, et cetera. So first, uh, the Bogolubov algebra. Well, you start with your Bogolubov quasi-particle creation and annihilation operator that you obtain through uh, the Bogolubov unitary uh, transformation from your very standard uh, particle creation and annihilation operator. So once you have uh, your quasi-particle operators, you can rework not the Hamiltonian, but the normal ordered grand canonical potential uh, in quasi-particle basis. And as for your Hamiltonian, where you have a one body, a two body, a three body part, here you have, because it's normal ordered, uh, a fully contracted zero body part, then you have a one body part where you have an omega one one term, which is associated with one creation, one annihilation operator, omega two, two O associated with two creation, zero operation, um, zero annihilation operator, zero two with zero creation to annihilation operator. So that's your one body part. Then you have the two body part with two, two, three, one, one, three, four, oh, oh, four. And you have, if need be, your three body part, your four body part, etc. You get the idea. Uh, once you have that, well, uh, you take your, B, your uh, IMS algae flow equation, you replace uh, H with omega, and you obtain your uh, BIMS RG flow equation. That's as simple as it gets. Uh, and now those commutators, well, you obtain a set of them for every component of the normal ordered quant potential. So for omega 2, 0, 1, 1, 0, 2, et cetera, for each of them, you obtain such a, uh, uh, such a commutator. And so if you go up to BIMSRG2, that is you keep uh, one body and two body operators, well, that yields you a lot of first uh, contribution. So your first contribution to the fully contracted uh, part of your organ canonical potential, uh, in which you have uh, fully contracted two body operators, uh, fully contracted, uh, fully contracted, sorry, one body operators, fully contracted two body operators. Uh, and of course, here you have uh, eta O2, omega O2O, o, but uh, you have as well, uh, when you permute the two of them, you have omega O2, uh, eta 2O. Uh, and then you have the, you have the one body part with omega 2O in which you have contribution coming uh, from a bunch of different terms with different patterns of contraction, omega 1, 1. 
And okay, you can skip uh, actually writing omega O2 because you just use the uh, multicity of your operators uh, to get it uh, from the omega 2 O uh, expression. But as you can see, that's already a lot of expression and that's just for the zero and the one body components of omega. You go to BIMSRG2, you want, uh, you want the two body as well. So you want, uh, you want the derivative of omega 4O, omega 3.1, omega 2.2, 2, et cetera. So it's really a lot of contributions uh, that arise. So how can you avoid errors in deriving all of them? Well, you want as yes, much as possible. 45 minutes through. Okay, thank you. You want as much as possible to automatize everything. Uh, that means you start from the equation, you want to move to diagrams. Okay, that's super standard procedure with many body methods. Uh, you want to move to diagrams because they are easier to manipulate. You can uh, defect factorize a bunch of terms with respect to uh, uh, using the Vick theorem and they reduce risks uh, in, in intermediate steps because they're easier to manipulate. You have less of them. So that's just less errors than having uh, huge equations in which at some point you will mistake, uh, mistake a sign or mistake a quasi-particle label. Uh, what we had here is going from diagrams to ideas and see matrices. Uh, what are they? Uh, they're, they are just graph theory tools that encompass all the necessary info. In a sense, they are only convenient data structure. They are just convenient data structures. They are easy in, to generate and manipulate because, well, uh, automatically because, well, they are just matrices. So that's something that a computer knows how to handle. And you can, uh, once you know how to construct them, you can use them to generate the diagrams and uh, their expressions. You can go all the way back uh, in this flow. So, okay, you need to rework first uh, BIM search in terms of diagrams. Uh, so the diagrammatic blocks are, okay, you re-express your grand canonical potential in terms of vertices. Uh, so you have uh, your fully normal ordered uh, contracted parts. Then you have uh, the one body part with mega one one in which you have one line going out for the creation operator, one coming in for the annihilation operator, two zero with two lines going, going out, uh, zero lines going in, O2, same thing for the one body part, uh, for the two body part, three body part, etc. Uh, so you do this for omega, you do this for eta, you do it this for every operator that you want uh, to, to evolve to using BIMSRG. And the nice thing is that uh, because BISRG term terms have a very simple recurring structure, you have an operator C that you obtain through the commutator of two operators A and B. Uh, for example, if we take uh, here uh, the O4, 4 O component of the uh, C11 term, uh, you see that you have uh, A, O4, A, B, 4, O that are contracted to, together on levels P, Q, P, Q, R, and that's about it. So only those two operators, some contractions uh, P, Q, R between them, and then as external legs, K1 and K2, that corresponds to the indices of your, uh, of your whole operator C. So that's very simple and that's beautiful because that makes for a very easy automation. Uh, so let's uh, introduce very quickly uh, what are agency matrices now because we, we will need them. Uh, well, they're just matrices in which your matrix elements A, I, J uh, are the number of edges, that is propagators going from node, node that is vertex I, I to node J. So here on this uh, Bogolubov MBPT diagram, for example, you have two lines uh, going from node I1 to node 2, so that's, that's A12 equals 2. Uh, two lines from node one to node three, that's uh, A13 equals two. Same thing for A23, and that's as simple as it gets. Uh, so now all we have to do is generate these matrices using simple algorithms and then use them to generate the diagrams. Uh, so how to generate the matrices? Well, we need to obtain the same of uh, set of constraints uh, of them. So what we do in the first place is, okay, uh, the external lines, we will encode them as if we had two additional vertices, one at the bottom, one at the top. 
and that gives us a four by four matrix. And now we know from BA's MSRG uh, that we have some constraints on our diagrams. We know that all lines go up. Uh, we know that we have no self-contraction uh, of a vertex on itself. And we know that all lines is connected to a vertex. That means we don't have lines uh, going from uh, the bottom directly to the top flowing through the diagram. So this we can translate into constraint on our matrix. Uh, all lines go up, that means it's upper triangular, no self-contractions. Uh, we have no, all the AIIs are zero, so the diagonal is empty. And if you have no line going from uh, the bottom to the top, then that means that A14 is equal to zero. So in the end, we have just those five uh, matrix elements here uh, that, determine, uh, that determine the shape of our diagram. So knowing that, uh, now we have a very simple algorithm. First, we select either A or B as the top operator. It's not relevant for designing the matrix, uh, but it's relevant for its post-treatment by our code. Uh, we select a valid vertex degree for uh, C for all operators. So that means we select uh, the number of uh, external legs. Uh, so that can be, uh, actually I should have put zero here as well. Uh, that can be zero, two, four, six, because it has uh, zero, one, two, three, four, it's the uh, body character. Uh, then we partition this, uh, this vertex degree uh, between incoming and outgoing legs. So those, uh, so the, the four, uh, the four uh, matrix elements that are on the exterior of the matrix and the sum of them has to be DC. Uh, we connect the external legs uh, to A and B. So that sets already two of the uh, four uh, in the end of the matrix element and A and B have to have the same parity uh, because what we will do is add the internal contractions and that will change the parity of both the A and B operator in the same way. Uh, so then we contract uh, and A and B up to a valid vertex degree and that's it, our matrix uh, is full, we have our diagram. Uh, so now that we know how to uh, generate matrices automatically, uh, we teach our code how to read the matrix, how to, to translate it into a nice uh, diagram using, using latex command, how to extract the expressions from it. Uh, we put everything into a carefully crafted latex file. Uh, we left the code to run for a few seconds, a few minutes. And uh, that's it, we have our diagram. So let's say you want to go up to BAMSRG you obtain uh, this whole bunch of diagrams. And actually here, it's only half of them because we, use, we used the Hermeticity. And actually already at the BIMSRG level, when we uh, had our code running, we realized that we had missed one diagram by hand uh, in, the, in the end made derivation. So already at that relatively simple uh, level, uh, it's re really super nice to have, uh, to have an automated tool that can do the thing for you. And then if you want to go to even higher orders, uh, that is incorporating higher body uh, operators, uh, you see that very soon, uh, even when you use the MTCT to reduce the number of diagrams uh, you treat, uh, well, that's something that you can not do by hand anymore. Even with time, even uh, using all the students in our, your group to derive the diagrams, that's just not feasible anymore. Uh, so your code is able to do all of this for that. And the other thing that means is in the case of BIMSRG, the formalism is com was complete to basically arbitrary order in the matter of three months of work only. So if you go back to this step now with your automated diagram generator, you can remove uh, the years uh, from the timeline equation here. Uh, and uh, and colleagues, uh, colleagues uh, Alexander Tishai and collaborators have worked on doing a similar work for the symmetry reduction for going from uh, M scheme to J scheme, uh, automatizing uh, all the Klebsch Gordon work uh, in the past few years, uh, reducing the time, uh, reducing once again the time that you need to go uh, from the idea that drives your formalism to a first uh, actual production. Uh, implementation. Uh, 
so that's uh, the state uh, of the code today. Uh, so I've not mentioned it yet, but the code is made in Python uh, using uh, ex some external libraries. Uh, the fact that it's in Python makes it pretty much OS independent. And it's available for uh, HFMBBT, BMBBT, and BIMSRG. Uh, so it gives you pretty simple information in the case of BIMSRG because the formalism is simple. Uh, but if you go to more involved formalism like uh, BMBPT, you see that uh, the set of information that the code gives you uh, is already uh, quite more uh, developed. Uh, so the code is available on GitHub, on PyPy, under GPL3 uh, license, and that means that you only need one, uh, one command line uh, instruction to install the code and run it uh, on your computer. And so now very briefly, because I'm already late, uh, the future uh, of the code, well, the idea is to extend our automated diagram generator uh, to three-body forces uh, with MBPT, because at the moment, uh, MBPT treatment only has the two-body uh, the, the two force included. And that will give uh, access to full uh, three-body calculations at high orders, uh, for example, to infinite matter practitioners. Uh, then do uh, extend it to uh, symmetry breaking uh, Gorkov self constant screen function calculation that will help uh, put uh, Gorkov calculation at the ADC3 level, uh, which is a truncation level that is actually the uh, workhorse on the symmetry conserving ve version. And that is needed if you want a quantitative spectroscopy for your open shell nuclei. You need the AT ADC3 for, uh, for a good spectroscopic properties. And that's uh, an ongoing work that has been started uh, by Francesco Raimondi during his time uh, in Saclay, and that needs uh, more time to be to be fully finished. And in the future as well, extend to single and multi-reference uh, symmetry conserving uh, IMSRG uh, to make future extensions of IMSRG safer. Uh, colleagues, uh, that is uh, Matthias Heinz and collaborators have realized when extending IMSRG to the IMSRG three uh, truncation level, uh, in their code that there were actually uh, mistakes in equations derived by colleagues uh, previously. Uh, and that would help include uh, triples excitation in the multi-reference IMSRG calculations uh, that are the ones uh, that are used in the IMGCM uh, framework that Benjamin described two weeks ago. And the thing is now to move to, to code. Uh, one of the nice things for uh, BMPPT is that there already exists uh, some code generator framework, namely the one of Christian Brichler. Uh, so there's already a possibility to uh, to in incorp uh, sorry to incorporate this to automatize this full uh, this full ab initio tool chain uh, in MVPT. Thankfully. Uh, it's not uh, it's not uh, feasible yet uh, for the other uh, formalisms, but of course, uh, that's thinking where that's something with we are thinking about. Uh, so now, very briefly, uh, summary of what I've uh, told you. So I've I told you about the tremendous progress of abinitho methods that are now reaching uh, up to and above A equals 100, with the limitations of mass on mass range being lifted through a uh, new formal and numerical developments, limitation in accuracy being lifted through better interaction fits. Uh, at the current abinitho frontier around, uh, abini uh, around uh, A equals 130, uh, even unconverged calculations can actually prove helpful uh, in comparing uh, with experiment and people are now doing convert calculation there. Uh, and we have a need for automated methods if we want to go to even higher precision methods in the future. And that uh, is being su successfully done in the ADG code. Uh, the work is only formal for now, uh, but that will just help us gain a lot of time in the future when we move to actual uh, production run there. And with that, uh, I thank you for your time and your attention. I thank the colleague from my group, uh, past collaborators and the funding agency. Thank you. All right, thank you, Pierre. I'm uh, giving you a clap of hands, a virtual clap of hands. Are there any questions from the audience? I can see Benjamin already has his... Uh, 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 yes, uh, I have two uh, or three questions, actually. 
Make, uh, make, it, make it brief, Benjamin. Let, yeah. let, let's start with one. Then we can leave this open for a discussion yeah. later. So yes. Yeah, so so one, one question is um, first concerning uh, like your density, uh, your density, your calculation of density. I was yeah. thinking, uh, did you try to, to just to plot the density at the artifact level to see the influence going from artifact to uh, Dyson self self constant construction or Dorkov? I don't even know if you use Dorkov for Dyson, but but anyway, the HF, the mean field versus the, the correlated uh, density. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, we might have done this. I'm not sure anymore. I would need to dive uh, to dive into uh, uh, into old plots to see if uh, to see if we we did it. I'm not sure anymore. Uh, what I can tell you though is that uh, going. Uh, for the symmetry conserving TIN 100, TIN 132, in which we were able to do a Dyson calculations to go ADC2, ADC3 level. What I can tell you here is that going ADC3 doesn't change much. Uh, and basically it's very, uh, the uncertainty on the uh, truncation order of the method is way smaller than the one we have uh, from it not being converged uh, due to model space limitations. Uh, so the limitations doesn't come from the uh, ab initio methods in the sense of truncation order. Once you've gone uh, post artifoc uh, I'm not sure anymore about uh, plots at the uh, Artrifoc uh, or Artrifoc Bogoli buff level, though. Um, maybe I had, I, uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, Tomas, you go ahead, I'll, I can ask later. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Pierre, for this uh, impressive talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I have just a, a question and a comment, probably, because uh, uh, every time I see uh, uh, the Abinicio plot of the, the first uh, slides in any Abinicio uh, talk, where, uh, where which are the limits of the current limits of the of the Abinicio methods to which are the, the nuclei that, the, that can be reached by Abinicio methods. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is nice. This is the, the I mean, this is the, the plot where uh, we can know that the initio is uh, able to produce numbers. But um, uh, what, which are the quality of those numbers? Because uh, I wonder if, uh, I mean, so you can, you can compute many nuclei, but uh, are you computing those nuclei properly? Or how, what is the, 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 the comparison, for example, with binding energies and so on? Uh, and I think, uh, I think that this kind of plus should be also complemented by the quality of the results, not only just by saying, okay, I can calculate this and that, but uh, just uh, <laughs> what is the, the, the comparison and the agreement with the experiment in this plot? Sure. Uh, the thing is, uh, it, uh, it really depends uh, first a bit of the methods, but more than anything, it depends on the interaction and that's uh, that's where the, the issue is lying uh, at the moment. So, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, so yeah, the thing is here, uh, here, for example, okay, it's not too far from the oxygen, uh, from uh, the values for the oxygen. And I know I already hear uh, Benjamin at home saying that, okay, the plot here has a very large, a uh, large energy scale and that we should plot things in terms of uh, energy per number of particles. And it's something that people are more and more doing. Uh, here, uh, basically in the oxygens, uh, it can be pretty much on top uh, of the uh, uh, of the experimental results. And uh, But that was a few years ago, traditionally, where the experimental accuracy would stop because then uh, you move to calcium and you overbind by 40, 50, uh, 50 MeV. Uh, it's, uh, it's changing because there has been a lot of new interactions that have come up uh, during the last years. Uh, so here I've shown uh, n 2 and the uh, uh, local, non-local, but there are uh, other ones, the n 
Quantum Marlite Nautic, uh, the Delta N2 logo that in incorporates uh, the Delta isobars, and that seem to be very promising in terms of reproducing uh, uh, all the different uh, all the different properties. Uh, but it's true that uh, apart from uh, from a few things, some a few methods. Uh, for relatively uh, relatively uh, light nuclei, or you have uh, you're lucky, for example, like us, and uh, the N two LOSAT uh, in a large nucleus uh, give you uh, a proper radius, uh, and there it yields you uh, proper density and um, a proper density and charge distribution. Uh, but uh, for example, if, if I were to show you uh, the local non-local result here, uh, I think like the density, uh, the density is here and then overshoots, uh, overshoots completely uh, here. Uh, so actually the thing is there is no real answer in terms of, uh, uh, or like, uh, there is uh, there is no real answer in terms of uh, those are the ones that we are able to calculate properly, and those not uh, because you have to take into account both the method uh, and the uh, and the interaction, and you have basically each time to test uh, see if it's close or not, and uh, and say it and be honest about uh, about how close it is or or not. Uh, but it's true that we cannot reach uh, yet uh, the level of uh, routine accuracy that you can have with shell model or with energy density functionals. Yeah, thank you. But even uh, even in those in those plots you showed, I think also apart from the from the size of the of the y axis, which is huge, I think also the size of the marker is also huge. And sometimes this is misleading. And if you show, for example, this fluorine. A chain and uh, I think uh, you just uh, see clearly that the uh, in yeah. in uh, yeah here I mean so even in the cases where you think you are on top of the experiment if you really zoom in the the dots there I think uh, uh, this is uh, far away from from the standards in other uh, in other methods yeah to to be fair that's uh that's now roughly held by ab initial standards. That's 2015. Uh, so I should update uh, update my selection here with uh, more recent calculation that might or might not, but might be uh, a bit closer to experiment. Uh, but now for sure, it's true that uh, a lot of progress uh, is on the way, uh, but uh, Depending on what you're looking at, it's not uh, it's not there yet in terms of uh, of accuracy, uh, and especially the the other thing is at the same time uh, the uncertainty of uh, and like the Carroll EFT uncertainty on the, of the Hamiltonian is such that actually uh, we should not focus too much uh, on uh, even the size of the plot markers because the uncertainty associated to the Hamiltonian is actually larger that, uh, than the plot marker. Uh, so we tend, and, and, me, uh, and me as well, to focus sometimes a bit too much on getting the plot marker on the experimental bar, uh, but actually the uncertainty are such that uh, we can uh, mislead, uh, our, mislead ourselves into thinking we are nailing thing uh, when, it's, uh, when it's not the case. Well, I mean, that would be equivalent to plotting all the, DF all the different DFTs on the, same, on the same plot in a sense, right? It's, it's, uh, also, it's not traditionally done, I would say. Yeah, in a uh, yeah, you have different things in sense of you have uh, the uncertainty in terms of uh, interaction A with respect to an interaction B, but you have uh, like the chiral order at which course, you go course, so into the, the interaction as well. And, uh, yeah, and the... I just wanted to point out that uh, Andrea wrote a comment that I think is also, I mean, you also went through this, but that it's not only the quality of the uh, of the approximation, it's also what type of observable you're you're looking at, right? So as, as you yes. were yourself pointing out, you know, in TIN you can perform a calculation for the charge density, but perhaps not for the yeah. uh, for the energy itself, etc. I see there are more raised hands. I just wanted to ask one quick question before we move to the other uh, raised hands and perhaps uh, uh, stop the recording. I, I thought your your Bogolyubov VMI Mercedes was a very interesting development. Of course, in the whole IMSRG. Um, 
there is a certain freedom in the choice of the eta function, right? Of this regulator that uh, allows you to decouple somehow. I mean, you have to choose this regulator in an optimal way so that you can achieve that goal of decoupling. And uh, I wonder, is there any uh, difference? Is there any uh, hint when you do it at the volume of level about, you know, is that, uh, about what type of regulator you should be choosing? Is there, is there something different there maybe that, that compared to say the standard um, IMSRG? Uh, th that's so that's the part uh, where you call my, my bluff and that's the part where I'm very happy to see uh, Alex turning on his camera and raising his hand <laughs> because he's more on the of the numeric recall guy on the BIM Sajif throng so he'll be uh, better suited to to answer your question yeah so maybe I can dive in here and, and comment on that so uh, so when you think of the IMSRG as an extension of the standard symmetry conserving case, what you try to suppress is basically the particle hole matrix elements that are responsible for the coupling of the reference state to uh, two particle to hole excitation. And um, the quasi-particle extension of this is pretty much suppressing the omega 4, 0, and 0, 4 components and uh, such that the, the generator can be pretty much set to zero probably in the 1, 3 case and the 2, 2 case. And then you uh, come up with some imaginary time extension uh, for the omega four zero and the omega, uh, sorry, for the eta four zero and the eta two zero. So this is pretty much then set to uh, omega four zero, like the flowing component of the of the grand potential. And then you adjust the the prefactor in such a way that the uh, generator turns out to be anti-hermation. And this is pretty much what would be the most naive choice for. For choosing the generator such that you have a denominator also in there as well that mimics this epstein nesbitt type of suppression in the symmetry conserving phase and the rest is uh yeah the, the bogle was extension of it let's say but presumably you guys are also thinking of i mean looking at the systematic uncertainty that comes from these choices or i mean is, is there a way to sure. do that well i mean in the end uh, the uh, the generator in, in an untruncated version the generator shouldn't matter at all so no matter what the generator is, your, your final converge result should be the same. And as long as you can make sure that this is the case, you're, you're pretty safe. But of course, in practice, you have to, to gauge this by testing various choices for the generator. So this is not clear, I would say, without testing. Let's say. Sure. All right. Um, did you have your hand up because you wanted to ask yeah. a question or maybe? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, it's still up. In fact, it's more of a comment because, I mean, we were discussing the, the reach of ab initio and, and uh, also, uh, yeah, what kind of observables are targeted. And, and I guess it's, we, as a practitioner, you can pretty much target the entire nuclear chart and you can run a calculation, but it's, it's, I think it's in the end about what is the reliable number that you can extract from your calculation. And um, so, so there I, I see that you have to clearly disentangle what kind of uncertainties enter your calculation. And this is finite model spaces, many body truncation and interaction uncertainties. And I think it's, it's becoming clearer also from the INT program, for instance, that uh, a full-fledged uncertainty analysis of these three components is absolutely mandatory for, for the field to evolve in the future. So um, I guess you can say that for a near spherical system, the many-body uncertainty from a non-perturbative calculation, like, like couple cluster IMSRG is roughly 2%. And uh, in the last five years, interactions became much better in the mid-mass system but the community also somewhat departed from, from the philosophy of fixing the low energy couplings in two and three nuclear sector. So if you are willing to give up this puristic point of view, then everything is fine. But from a uh, effective field theory perspective, uh, the two and three nuclear force should be fixed in the two and three nuclear sector. So it's also a matter of, of course, we can fix the interaction in a 40 body system. And then it's not so surprising that we get a 40 body system correct, but that's not truly what what is um, what probably should be viewed as emergent phenomena in mid mass systems. So I think one has to be a bit a bit careful here and, and where the interactions emerge from and, and what they are fixed to. Yep, I, I guess I totally agree with that uh, um, view. Um, Perhaps that's a good point to at least uh, stop the recording. Uh, Benjamin, I'm, I'm going to stop the recording and then maybe you can ask your question and we can leave this up and running and keep the discussion going. But uh, uh, in the meantime, those of uh, uh, you know, 
everybody else who perhaps is busy and has something else to do can can uh, leave. Uh, I'll, I'll just, I guess, thank you officially and from the uh, from our perspective, Pierre, for giving us such a nice talk. Uh, and well, uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity. Really uh, appreciate. Uh, well, see you. I guess all of you in two weeks' time, we will have a, a talk moving into again into few body systems uh, with strangeness uh, and some of the open questions on the hyper triton uh, by Axel Perez um, Obiola. All right, so thank you. Okay.